The former president defeated in a heated election, trying to recapture the office four years later, setting up a rematch for the White House. Sounds familiar, maybe? Because we're not talking about 2024, but 1892. Donald Trump is trying to pull a Grover Cleveland. Cleveland is the only person ever to win two non-consecutive terms as president. He is the unique figure in the history of the American presidency. So why do Americans know so little about him? Scott McFarland takes us to the one community in America where Cleveland is more than just a name in a history book. You're looking at one of America's most humble historic sites, the birthplace of one of just 14 men to ever serve eight years as U.S. president. And yes, it's across the street from a gas station and a donut shop. This house in Caldwell, New Jersey, about 20 miles outside of New York, is where Grover Cleveland was born, near the Presbyterian Church where his dad was pastor. Sharon Farrell has been the tour guide here since 1980. Yes. This was the family parlor. This is where all of the activity took place. Cleveland was America's 22nd president, and its 24th president, too the only president to ever win a rematch after losing the White House. Nationwide, there is little to mark this unique presidency other than a rest area off the New Jersey Turnpike. Caldwell also has the Grover Cleveland Apartments and Grover Cleveland Park, Middle School, and even this parking spot. But Cleveland is beloved here in Caldwell, including by Carlos Pomares, who says 130 years later, Cleveland was his inspiration to run for the local county commission. How could you not be inspired? The guy had this meteoric rise in a matter of four years based on just being a hard worker, honest, brutally honest at times, yeah. and uh, being one who just uh, stuck to his, to his beliefs. You think he was principled? Absolutely. Let's see what you got. Why don't you pull the first one out? Pomares' home is filled with Cleveland historic pieces, ribbons, busts, and that is a Grover Cleveland brandy bottle. It's got the cork in it still. But outside of Caldwell, this unparalleled president is relatively unknown. Grover Cleveland is one of the strangest stories in terms of somebody getting to the White House. I always think the most interesting place to start with Cleveland is in the middle of his life. Troy Senek is author of A Man of Iron, A Life Story of Cleveland. If you go to the year 1881, that's the year he turns 44, and you found Grover Cleveland, you would find a boring, balding, unmarried, workaday lawyer in Buffalo living in a little apartment above his law practice. The only reason that any of this is interesting is I'm describing to you somebody who's three years away from becoming the president of the United States. Cleveland, the fifth of nine children in a middle-class family, parlayed a law career in New York into becoming mayor of Buffalo and briefly governor of New York. Viewed as principled and ethical, Cleveland was drafted by Democratic Party bosses to run for president amid an era of corruption, patronage, and unethical power brokers. He won, making history, but not headlines. If you're looking at the late 19th century, if you're looking at the Gilded Age, the debates are about tariffs. They're about silver in the money supply. They're about pensions for union veterans. We don't know how to think about any of these That's things. That's not exciting stuff. It's not exciting stuff. He began as a rare bachelor president. His White House wedding to a friend's daughter, 27 years younger than him, was a spectacle. They were married in the blue room of the White House. John Philip Sousa led the band. And, Big uh, event. Yeah, it was uh, ships, uh, bells went off, whistles went off, church bells were chiming. Cleveland lost his re-election race to Indiana Republican Benjamin Harrison in 1888, despite winning the popular vote. And he was initially content with retirement. He was somewhat relieved. He felt that he had done a decent job in his first term. Until he was pressed by his party leaders to run again in 1892 and narrowly vanquished his old rival, Harrison, and moved back into 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. As Donald Trump seeks to equal Cleveland's accomplishment, Senek warns other than both being New Yorkers and disliking the press, the two men couldn't be more different. But they really occupy very different places in their parties because you have Cleveland fighting this rearguard to keep the Democratic Party from changing. And Trump is on the opposite side of this equation. He is leading the populist insurgency in the Republican Party. So Trump's a revolutionary. Cleveland is a counter-revolutionary. Though Cleveland's new first lady foreshadowed the comeback in the final days of her husband's first term. She tells a member of the domestic staff in the White House, 
make sure that you pack up everything very carefully because we want it to be just where we remember it when we come back. And the staffer assumes that they're planning some visit in the Harrison administration. Says, Mrs. Cleveland, when will that be? She says, we're coming back four years from today. Cleveland's second victory came just weeks before the start of an economic panic and crisis. It crippled the nation and consumed Cleveland's second term. It was the worst thing the country had seen up to that time. In his first year? In his first year back. So he has this window of good luck that is just small enough to get him back to the presidency. And it does not stay with him during his second term. Pomares says Cleveland may not have made a dent in the history books, but he made Washington a more honest place. Why does nobody else talk about him? Because he wasn't flashy. <laughs> he wasn't, he wasn't a about me kind of guy. We'll find out in November if Grover Cleveland's unique historic accomplishment is matched. But until then, and perhaps after, he will remain an obscure former president whose historic site is humbly next to a gas station and donut shop. For CBS Saturday Morning, Scott McFarland, Caldwell, New Jersey. I love the Grove, mostly because he served as mayor of Buffalo. Mm. But we were talking about some other really interesting facts. He's the first Democrat elected president after the Civil War. Sure. He won the Electoral College three times, mm. not just twice, but lost one, won the popular vote, I should say, three times, but lost one of those because he lost the Electoral College. I'm just an interesting guy. It's fascinating history. You know what I know? What? That Exxon gas station. I ran out of gas nearby. Did you really? They were really Did kind. you stop? Did you go to the Duncan I, afterward? Did you stop at the Duncan? Duncan? Of course. Okay, yeah. well, next time you gotta also. Well, it's a twofer. You know, pay some honor to the Cleve. 